In chapter 46, um, Jacob goes to Egypt. You've got to understand that Moses is writing this. And Moses is writing this for a generation who were born in Egypt. And those people that Moses was writing for, they'd be much more interested in every detail, much more interested than we are interested. Because they want to know how they got to Egypt. They want to know what brought their families into Egypt. They're actually being told about their own families and their old history. We have people who sometimes go all over the world looking for the histories of their families. You and I read it and we're not interested in it at all. We say, this is boring. What does this have to do with us? But then if we find out, this is my family. These were my great, 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 great grandparents. These are the people who gave me my name. These are the people whose blood I am descended from. Then it becomes a much more interesting thing. And so Moses is writing in the generation of the Exodus. He's writing for the people who left Egypt. And he's telling them how their family got to Egypt in the first place. They took everything with them all their material wealth and livestock. They leave Beersheba, verse 5, which is in the southwest desert of Israel, to make the journey across the desert to Egypt, and they take all their children with them. Verse 8, we see the names of everybody who came. This is very important to the Israelites to know the name. And by verse 27, we see that there were 70 of them. There were 70 people in Jacob's family who came down to Egypt. Verse 19 says that Joseph went out to meet them. He prepared his chariot. They came to a place called Goshen, which was the place where they would, they would live. And so we have the great meeting between Joseph and Jacob after all these years in chapter 46 and in verse 29. As soon as Joseph appeared before his father, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. Then Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I've seen your face and I've seen that you're still alive. What he's saying is, there's nothing more than that I want from life. If you're alive, and I get to see you again, and I get to have this reunion with you again, there's nothing more that I want from life than this. This is the best thing that life can give me, so I may as well die. Because I now have all that I want from life. Joseph said to his brothers, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say, My brothers and my father have come. Now, there's a little problem here. The men are shepherds. And um, that's going to be bad news for the Egyptians because they don't really like shepherds. Um, so they're going to... They're gonna, live in a different part of the land, down in the land of Goshen. Chapter 47 is about the settlement of Joseph's family in the land and about the meeting between Joseph and Pharaoh. Verse 7, Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Now, that's something we need to notice. A few years ago, one of our famous preachers on television in the United States said that he was going to run for president. He did run for president. He was embarrassed. That was 25 years ago. He didn't get many votes 22 years ago. He was embarrassed. When I first heard that he was going to run for president, I said, why should he step down? 
Why should he go from a high place of being a preacher of the Word of God to a lower place to be President of the United States? Why would he want to do that? Why would he want to take a step down? The book of Hebrews says that it is the greater who blesses the lower. When Jacob, this shepherd in Canaan, met Pharaoh, the ruler of the greatest nation on earth in the second millennium BC, Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Why did Jacob bless Pharaoh? Because Jacob was greater. Because Jacob knew God. Because Pharaoh only had secular and material greatness. It was Jacob who had spiritual greatness. Pharaoh had no blessing for Jacob that could do Jacob any good. Jacob already knew the one true God. It was Pharaoh who needed Jacob's blessing and not the other way around. Um, Pharaoh asked Jacob, how long have you, how old are you? He says, 130 years old. Now here's the pessimistic perspective, the negative perspective that Jacob has on his life. Few and unpleasant. This is Genesis 47, verse 9. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. We see a second time, Jacob blessed Pharaoh. He went out from his presence. Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had ordered. Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to their little ones because the famine was still going on in the land. Joseph was still doing his work of selling the food and of devising ways that people who were out of money could get food that had been saved in the granaries of Egypt. And basically what happens is Joseph makes the throne of Pharaoh wealthy because of his plan, because Pharaoh alone had food in Egypt and the people gave up their property to stay alive. That's what it says in verse 20, Genesis 47, 20. Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. Now again, you've got to understand the psychology of these slaves who are leaving Egypt. Egypt which seems so mighty and so powerful. What Moses is teaching them is the only reason Egypt became mighty and powerful was because someone in our family made Pharaoh great. His name was Joseph. Pharaoh owed his greatness to a Jew called Joseph. It was important that they understand that because the country they were leaving seemed so great and the place they were going seemed so low. Joseph said to the people, verse 23, Behold, I have today bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Here is your seed, now go sow the land. And as you have a prophet, you bring the harvest to Pharaoh. Um, verse 29, Jacob is about to die. And before he dies, he makes Joseph promise him that he can be buried not in Egypt, but in Canaan. Verse 29, when the time for Israel to die drew near, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Please, if I have found favor in your sight, place now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Please do not bury me in Egypt. But when I lie down with my fathers, you should carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. So Joseph tells him, I will do as you say. And he said, Swear to me. So he swore to him. Then Israel bowed in worship at the head of his bed. Now, this again is the highlight of Jacob's life. 
at the end of his life, he has learned to be a, a worshiper. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. And in chapter 48, we see what happens during the last days of... Uh, during the last days of Jacob. Joseph brings his sons to his father for blessing. And uh, what happens is that Joseph expects that his father will give the greater blessing to the older son, but he doesn't. Look at verse 12, Genesis 48, verse 12. Joseph took his children uh, from his knees, and he bows before his father. Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right, and brought them close to him. But Israel, Israel stretched out his hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh, crossing his hands. Here's what happened. He brings the older son to stand right here, and he brings the younger son to stand right here, believing that the greater blessing is going to go here through the right hand. And Jacob does this. And he shocks Joseph. And um, he blesses Joseph in, chapter, in verses 15 and 16. And in verse 17, Joseph doesn't like it. He doesn't like what his father did. And he tries to change the hands. Verse 18, Joseph says, Not so, my father. But his father refused and says, I know, I know, I know what your argument is. And he will, the older son will become great, but the younger one will become greater. He blessed them that day. Now the question is, how did they know these things? Because God made them to know it. That's the only way they knew that's the only way the prophecies came true, because God told them, just like He told Joseph the meaning of the dreams. The same God told Joseph what would happen, in the, told Jacob what would happen in the future. So He puts Ephraim, the younger, before Manasseh, the older, in verse 20. Then Israel says to Joseph, Behold, I'm about to, got to die, but God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your fathers. And then in chapter 49, Jacob makes prophecies concerning all his sons. We don't have to look at all those prophecies. Some of them are important. A prophecy to Judah is important. Genesis 49.10. Many people believe that Genesis 49.10 is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. It says that the scepter would not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Many people believe that that word Shiloh, um, which means the one to whom it belongs, many people believe that that reference to Shiloh is a blessing to Jesus. It says about Shiloh, to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. There are, there are those also who think that the scepter was removed from Judah in 70 A.D. There are other theories about what the scepter could mean. It could mean when Israel lost its so when Judah lost its sovereignty to the Babylonians or when Israel lost its sovereignty to the Romans. But certainly by 70 A.D., when the Romans destroyed the temple and evacuated Jerusalem, the scepter had left Judah, but Shiloh had come. The Lord Jesus had come in that generation. 
Jacob is prophesying about the future of his son's descendants, the 12 tribes of Israel. And I, we talked a moment ago about how Jacob leaned on his staff and he worshiped. We talked about what a good thing it was when he was received an injury in chapter 32, which made it impossible for him to run anymore. He always walked with a limp. And now we see him at the end of, Jesus, of Genesis worshiping while he's leaning on his staff. It's when Jacob shows his weakness that he shows his greatness. It's interesting that in Hebrews chapter 11 in the, in the New Testament, there's a great survey. We call it Faith's Hall of Fame of these great things that these Old Testament saints accomplished. Now, Jacob had a very, very adventurous life, a very adventurous life. He went into exile when he was a young man. He stayed away for 20 years. He married two women. He came back rich. He reconciled with his brother. Uh, he lost his sons. He regained his sons. His son became a ruler in Egypt. He moved to Egypt. He died in Egypt. He became the father of the 12 patriarchs, the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. We think of all those great adventures. And the author of the, of the book of Hebrews is pointing to Jacob's greatness. What does he talk about? He talks about Genesis 49. He talks about Jacob blessing his sons. Hebrews 11, verse 21. By faith, Jacob as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. What's so great about that? Well, the thing that's great about it is that Jacob was showing faith in what God would do without him. Faith in what God would do in the future with no help from Jacob. Jacob's whole problem was that he wanted to do it his way instead of God and without God. Finally, he came to a time in his life when he realized that things would be done God's way according to God's plan with no help from interference by our plans. Jacob didn't come to that understanding until the very end of his life. The earlier we understand that, the better off we will be. But we praise God that it finally did happen in Jacob's life.